on my end it says we're streaming live on facebook that's exciting that's very exciting let me uh i still i have a blue bar that's loading so let me just see if can take <laughs> this here it's an adventure for us all all right that's I right think, i think we're going man i think we're going all right um so yeah for anyone that seems to think that i don't know what i'm doing that's mostly because I don't um, in terms of <laughs> the Zoom interface to go live on Facebook. I think it's working. Um, but anyway, uh, if you're watching this, hello. Thank you for, for being here with us. Uh, I'm Dan Morrison. Uh, I'm the director of bands at Reagan High School. I've also um, started the Happy Not Satisfied lifestyle and mindset and movement. Um, and I'm super excited to be talking with one of my closest friends and a mentor of mine, um, an amazing person and just a, a brilliant mind, um, Jeremy Spicer. Thank you, Jeremy, for being here with us today, being here with me today, I guess you should say. <laughs> um, you know, I want, before we jump in, I wanted to tell you a funny story that I'm sure you don't remember, but the, one of the first times I really, because you and I, I mean, we've gotten pretty close friends, but over like the last five or six years maybe. Before that, we hardly really knew each other, we knew of each other probably in some regard, but um, I think it was 2013, and I promise this isn't gonna be a big band conversation, but this is a, a quick band story. Um, we were at retreat at BOA San Antonio Finals, uh, and we were standing right next to you, and that was like a, a crazy year with a lot of results that were all over the place, and you guys won music, and it was super cool. <laughs> And like, I just looked at you and it, it was just, it, I was watching you process what had just happened because I, I don't think, I mean, no one expects to win music or anything at that contest, but it was such a cool moment to just you see you completely off guard, <laughs> hear that announcement. And I think about that all the time. I don't think I've ever told you that story. But anyway, I, uh, I, I, I wanted to tell you that because it's something I think about a lot. And I also wanted to give you a chance to kind of say a few things, you know, obviously, you have this amazing business, you were an incredible band director, you know, you're somebody I look up to in both of those worlds. But if you could just talk a minute about your history, I think that'd be really cool. Yeah, um, that was a crazy night for sure. Uh, none of that was expected. And there's lots of backstories to all of that. But very crazy. I remember uh, you also know Mark Kalima, another band director at the time. But um, at that moment, um, when they announced us, I just remember being tackled by him. Like when I had that look on my face and I didn't know what was going on. He was like screaming at me, you want music? And I was like, what's going on right now? I had no idea. Um, but a little bit about myself. I actually grew up in South Texas, not far from where you are now, Floresville, Texas, about 45 minutes south of San Antonio. Um, and I ended up going to school. I was a trumpet player. I am a trumpet player like you are and ended up going to school school at uh, Texas State University. It was Southwest Texas State University at the time. Jim Hudson and John Stansbury were uh, my band directors. And for a uh, turn of fate, whatever you want to call it, I got uh, a job as a trumpet and French horn private lesson teacher at Cedar Park High School, this brand new high school. There was one of those little, you know, it's a, like little pull tab things that people uh, would advertise at colleges and you rip off the little tabs. Um, and there was a little sign that said private lesson teachers needed. And this was in 1999. So I, this was on Mr. Hudson's uh, office door. I ripped the sign down because uh, I didn't want anyone else to apply for the job. And I was in the food industry. I was working at Foo Shack's Barbecue. And I, did, I was sick of working at Foo Shack's Barbecue. And I want to start teaching music. So I went and I started driving to this place. And it from San Marcos. I mean, it literally, literally took me an hour and 15 minutes to get out there. And back then, it was 1999. There was nothing, literally nothing out in Cedar Park. I drove past Cedar Park. I actually pulled into Cedar Park Middle School thinking it was a high school. It wasn't. It kept going. And eventually, um, I got hired. Pulled into high school. I got, I got hired as their trumpet private lesson teacher. And then um, the, the head band director at the time, Ron Morrison, said, do you have any marching band experience? And I just got off the road with the Santa Clara Vanguard playing mellophone, and he called uh, one of the staff members and luminary Texas band director, Bill Watson, while I was sitting in front of him. He's like, so Bill was one of your teachers? I'm like, yes, sir. So he called Bill, and uh, for whatever reason, and thankfully, Bill, one of, my, one of my greatest mentors, told Ron to hire me, and he did. Um, and the rest is kind of history. I helped to run the visual program at Cedar Park uh, for two years while I was in college. Um, and taught private lessons the entire time I was there. 
and then got hired as a band director and was there as a band director at Cedar Park in some capacity uh, for eight years. In the beginning, I was the, the second assistant under Steve Wessels, who is the recently retired longtime luminary band director from Cedar Park. Um, and then he became my boss in 0405, something like that. And we worked together through 09. And then I had the unique experience to open Bandigert High School in 2009. And we grew that thing from 2009 to 2013, uh, actually spring 2014, uh, which I stepped away and then Mike Howard's t taking it over and then just put the pedal to the metal with it. So it's been quite the experience. Um, and through all of that, we, we started this and we'll talk more about this, but we started this organization called Sassy. And that's kind of me. So South Texas, small town boy, uh, grew up. SWT Bobcat into Cedar Park and Vandergrift and along the way Sassy. So that's a little bit of me. Yeah, that's great. And and thanks for sharing that. That's an amazing story about ripping the thing off the wall at the, <laughs> with the private situations. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you knew what you wanted and you did what it took to get it. I, that's <laughs> awesome. Um, yep. so, you know, part of the reason I wanted specifically to talk to you is because I've always looked at you as somebody that you know, kind of embodied this idea of being happy, not satisfied in so many ways, um, because you were a band director at the highest level. You started a business that is now like super successful and well-known and not just across the state or even the nation, but like going international. Um, and it just seems like when I look at you, you are the type of person that always wants to find a way to get better at what you're doing. And you also want to branch your interests out find new things and then get better at those things, which I mean, that completely resonates with me and this whole idea. So, um, you know, I guess my first question would be, what, what motivated you to start, I guess, start or continue and build this business? And maybe even before that, if you want to say a few words about exactly what Sassy is. Yeah, um, the company started in 02 and as i told you my first boss was ron morrison and i will i've always given credit and we'll give credit to him as the brainchild behind sassy he had he had come from um uh the houston area and he was teaching band in the houston area and he had always done his own leadership stuff there and he came to cedar park and he thankfully hired me and he had this idea and he started teaching leadership camps at cedar park uh to our own kids um and I remember distinctly that the kids were coming back from some camps that I'd gone to in the summer. And I was like, man, this is, we can do better. And he had already been teaching his leadership stuff. And I had just met the gentleman who is now one of my, my very best friends and the director of bands at the Melbourne Conservatory, Dr. Nicholas Williams. I had just met him teaching Southwind. I was like, man, I got this guy and he, he teaches at the University of North Texas. And like, he could teach how to flap the arms and like I could teach some marching stuff and you could do your leadership thing. And like, we could just do this better. Like, let's go. And I'm a 22 year old kid. Like, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I was like, we can do this. Let's do it. Let's take over the world. And he wanted to do it. He had already had plans of starting something like this. So he laid the groundwork and foundation. He was a, he, I mean, at that point, probably in his uh, mid, th mid to late thirties, I don't know exactly, but he laid the foundation. He started the company Sassy. Uh, which stands for Solutions and Specialized Innovations, but he started it all, um, and it all kind of came about on the the blacktop at or the the marching band pad at Cedar Park High School. Of, let's do this. We we think we can do it better, and let's see where it takes us. And then from there, Ron had some other um, opportunities for himself, and he actually stepped away from public education for a while to do some corporate leadership things. And he asked me if I would run the student leadership side of things. So I was like, well, yeah, absolutely, please. And this was all around the time of 04, 05, somewhere in there. Um, and he turned it over to me. And basically at that point, became, he was, we were partners. And we continue to be partners. I don't remember the exact year, but at some point, um, I, I actually bought the company completely from him. Um, and he stepped away whole, uh, wholeheartedly, and I took over, and we grew up from there. And the rest is kind of history. All of this going on, this is, it, it encompassed my entire band directing career uh, while we were running Sassy and doing this at the same time. Um, so that's, it's just a little brief history of Sassy, where it came from started by Ron and then I took it over and we grew it. 
Um, and I, I remember, I think the year I took over in that like 04, 05, we had like, I don't know, 15, 16 camps um, in the state of Texas. And last year, pre-pandemic, we did almost 130. We did 127 camps and we got to go to Thailand and do some things in Thailand. Um, and even this year in the pandemic, we had 101 camps uh, that we did all virtually. Um, that was, uh, we, uh, there was some, some pressure from some that they really wanted us to come out in person, but I just felt best for myself and the faculty at SASE that we just kept it virtual. But just in thinking about new things and rebranding ourselves, we, we took it to a virtual state and it was great. Had a lot of fun doing it. So it's been going on since 02 in some capacity and it's continually evolved into something new and different uh, every single year. And I think that's part of what, excuse me, part of what makes it work so well. So yeah, that's just a brief history of the organization. Yeah, and so, I mean, that's insane growth. And even like, mm -hmm. I've only been involved for maybe four or five years and I've known about it for a few years more than that. And even in that time, I feel like it's, it's grown like exponentially. So. I'm sure that you could answer this for a long time and have a lot of things to say, but what are some of the main sort of facets that you attribute that growth to in that business? Um, from the business side of things, I think that growth comes from first and foremost, and I think you're, you are experiencing this now, you have to put something out that people see as a value and that's of high quality. And I think that's number one. And, and the content that whatever you're creating and uh, for people that in your heart and soul, you're truly trying to help people. And I think that's what's helping you right now in this happy did not satisfied movement is you're creating something that's, that's beneficial to people and that people resonate with. And I think that's part of the growth of Sassy and the continued growth of Sassy is that every year there's new curriculum. We're not, the, the curriculum that was taught in 02 is not taught today. It, there may be, foundational aspects of that curriculum but it's it's new and it's different because the students in 02 are different than the students in 2020 and throughout our entire existence so I think the growth comes from creating content and creating curriculum that's relevant for kids where they are at that point and for on that for band directors and band programs where they are at that point I think the other key part of all of this um, which you are of course doing in, in your venture is you just have to surround yourself with the right people. And I think that's been part of the growth for us. Like my, my goal when I took over from Ron was I wanted to expand the staff because I knew I couldn't do it all. And I wanted to make sure that the staff that I brought on were the people that needed to be there. So I reached out to the very best in the profession, in my opinion, and brought them into the fold in some way, shape or form. And then um, the other part of that is it, sometimes you try you try different things, you try different people, you try to, and sometimes it doesn't work out and that's okay. That's not a negative. That's not a positive. That's not an, a testament. Just sometimes there's not a fit. And I think in building a business, you have to be comfortable to say, you know what, like this isn't working. We need to take a turn and we need to go this way or we need to go that way. And I think that's been part of it as well. Just making sure that the right people are on and that we keep the right people on throughout it all. So I think all of those things have attributed to our success. Um, and then the other thing I, I just, I really, I'm pretty passionate about constantly evolving and maybe part of it is because I get bored with how we do things or it's like, yeah, we've done that. Like it's working, which is cool, but just reimagining things. I remember one time at the university of Houston, I brought in some of the key players um, on the SASE faculty. We sat in a hotel room at the university of Houston. This was several years ago. And I just said, sweet if it was all different, if it all looked different, what would it look like? We just sat in a room, maybe with some adult beverages and I had a computer and I just typed feverishly of what does it look like? What could it be? How would it be different? Why would we do it that way? And it was just random thoughts. Nothing was set in stone. I just wanted ideas. And I think that continuous improvement idea and mindset, if you want to use that phrase or whatever, but just this for me that, it has to be different. And part of it, like I said, is that I get bored with it being a, the other way, but it has to be different because it has to be different because it has to evolve. And I don't want to get stagnant and I don't want the curriculum to get stagnant. And I don't want the students to, because me at, at times I could have been a challenging student when I was in high school and I always wanted to teach the way I want to be taught and constantly be engaged. So I'm trying, when we bring that to the table at SASE, I, I continually keep that in the forefront of my brain of, 
would, would I buy into what I'm being sold right now? What I'm being taught right now, are they reaching me? And if the answer is yes, me being a challenging student that I was, uh, not challenging in, in a, well, I guess it could be a negative, but I was always questioning. Um, and for me in high school, like it, it was always a questioning, like, why are we doing this? What are we doing? Why, what, what are they trying to get me to learn out of this? Sometimes to the point of negativity, but it was that constant questioning, constant questioning. So I, I continually asked myself, and even like you, people always, yeah, all the sassy staff look at me, like when I, I sit back and I cross my arms and I'm watching other faculty teach and I'm kind of pacing, and I'm watching them teach and it's just one of those I want to make sure that we're doing whatever we need to do to reach the kids wherever they are so I think all of those things that's a long-winded answer and sorry I'm rambling but it's I think all of those things have attributed to our success as as an organization I mean it's a great answer and like I said I'm sure you could talk about it for even longer if if given the opportunity uh, and there's I, so many great takeaways from that I think and one of them is the fact that what I have found is that almost every successful person that I talk to in some way, shape or form kind of resonates with what you're talking about in terms of like, you can't stagnate, you have to get better, you have to change. Like, and it's not about being bored. It's just, I feel like in life, there is no, there's no staying the same, right? You're either growing or you're going in the opposite direction. And I think to me, that's kind of like, I feel like I tried to sort of, almost quantify that into this phrase of happy, not satisfied, because that's what it means to me. So that's the essence of it is what you were just talking about. And it reminds me of, I don't know if you've read a book called Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. He's the founder of Nike. Uh, he has an amazing story. I mean, he started out by selling Japanese sneakers out of his trunk. Um, and now, you know, he owns one of the largest corporations in the world. Um, but his sort of catchphrase through his career was grow or die. I mean, that's, it's a little extreme, but that's, that's what it was. That's what it boiled down to for him. And I think about that all the time because I'm, I'm the type of person that kind of resonates with extreme. Um, yeah. like this guy, David Goggins, who is all about like maximizing your effort beyond what you could ever imagine. You're like, I love that. It's not everyone's cup of tea, but so like that grow or die mentality, you obviously take it with a little bit of a grain of salt, but I think it's, in me watching you grow your business, that's what I so see from it is that you never are going to do the same thing and you're never going to let it just stay. You're not going to rest on your laurels. You're always, you have that fire in you that the next time you do it has to be the best time. And it's got to be as good and as passionate as it was the first time and the hundredth time. And that's, I think what truly like successful individuals have figured out. Um, even, you know, you think about somebody that's doing a show eight nights a week on Broadway. They're, they can't just think, oh, I've done this a million times, let's go through the motions. They have to find a way to make it feel like the first time for them every single night, and they do. And that's why those people who are on Broadway are so incredible without fail, because they've just kind of tapped into this mentality, I think. So it's really cool to hear sure. you talk about that. Um, because it's, it's just so in line with exactly how I feel about things and what I see from so many successful people. Um, so I think a big question for me and maybe what a lot of people that know you kind of wonder, I mean, you were a band director at the absolute highest level. And for those of you watching that maybe don't know the band world as well, I mean, it's, especially in the fall, you're looking at 100 hour weeks, easy. Um, you're looking at a Saturday that might start at three in the morning and end at four in the morning the next day. Um, it's, it's, it's brutal. It's grueling and it's very rewarding, but it's, it's really tough. So how on earth did you do that Win the state marching contest, just for some, you know, uh, perspective on how good you were at what you did. It wasn't like you were just phoning it in every day. How are you doing that while building this business that was flourishing and is, flourishing even more now like what were like what was your mindset what was your approach well I the the approach was just work non-stop <laughs> right wrong or indifferent good bad or well, however you want to look at it it was just work non-stop um and the way that worked for me when I was at Cedar Park and at Vandegrift was I would I would teach band all day like you're talking about I'd get back sometimes six seven eight nine o'clock depending on the day depending on the time 
then I'd be a dad for a couple of hours. Um, and then my wife would go to bed, my kids would go to bed because they were younger at the time. And then I would stay up till midnight, one, two, three, whatever it took in the morning working on Sassy. And then I'd get up and do it all again the next day. And that was the gig. And thankfully, um, I had a wife that would put up with me and put up with that. And she was wonderful and helped to raise the children and all of that stuff. But it was a balancing act of me teaching all day, going nonstop all day. And then I would just do sassy all night and I would do curriculum all night or I would schedule all night or I would do all night. And that would just be what it was. And it was that way. Some people are like, they're, as you are, you're not afraid of the dark as it goes. Like you're, you're the 430 guy, which is awesome. And there are several people that do that. I may, I may stay up late. Like that's how my world works. Like I would rather not go to bed. I can work till one, one or two in the morning. And then on the flip side, getting up at six or seven, that's just what it was for me. It's just a train thing. People work differently in different ways. So that's what it was for me. And that's how we did it uh, for years, years and years and years from 02 actually to 14. So that'd be 12 years of me doing that, running the, I wasn't the head band director at Cedar Park, but I, I was the marching band director and I ran all of that. And I was the second band director. I was a jazz band director at Cedar Park with Steve. And then be, as you know, being a head band director, when you take over Vandergrift and we were building the program from scratch and all of those things. So it was just um, one of, like you, you talk about there are different mantras and different things. And you said like uh, grow or, die or whatever the Nike guy said and happy, not satisfied. And there's all of them. You were talking about the, you can't hurt me. That's the David Goggins guy, right? Yeah. The book. Yeah. yeah. Um, mine and Mike still talks about it with the kids at Vandergrift. Mine was all you can control is how hard you work. Like I would tell the kids from the tower, I would say all you can control and they would have to say how hard you work. Like we can't control anything else. And, um, and we, we could control our choices, but how hard we work is a part of one of those choices. And I think, in developing the two, I knew I wanted Sassy to be something, and I wasn't ever, ever, ever gonna not let the bands that I was working with and the students that I was working for not be successful either. They had to both be successful. So you just, I burnt the candle at both ends. Um, and that's, that's, how we, that's how we built it. And it was just basically two full-time jobs when it comes down to it. By the time it was all said and done, when I uh, ultimately made the, the choice to step away from band directing in 20. 2014 um it was something in my brain something I had to give because this thing was growing and the Vandegrift thing was growing and like which one was growing and where was I going to go and where was I going to put my energy and I couldn't do both at the level that I knew I wanted them both to be so it was just one of those tough decisions in life and um it was a it, I, it was one it was the toughest decision I've ever had to make but it was the right decision for myself and my family and for the sassy organization yeah yeah and i mean i think one of my takeaways from what you just said and, and how hard you worked and how many hours you worked and it kind of boils down to priorities um because you hear people a lot whoa oh. <laughs> all right it's back on <laughs> you hear people a lot say i don't have time for whatever i don't have time to work out or i don't have time to figure out how to eat the right way or i don't have time to I have this passion that I would love to develop on the side, but I don't have time to do it. And I think, you know, to a certain extent that may be true for some people, but I also think that if you really truly are willing to make things like to prioritize, prioritize things and push yourself maybe beyond what you thought you could a little bit, you would, you'll be amazed at what the outcome could be. And I think you're a perfect example of that. I mean, to be functioning at the highest level, literally in two, like you said, two full-time jobs at the same time, um, you know, you prove that it's possible and you hear about other stories like that of people who are paying, are doing a job to pay the bills while they're doing, developing their passion career on the side. Um, and you know, that stuff can't happen unless you make a conscious decision that you are just going to do what it takes to make it happen. Um, yeah. that's not to say that you shouldn't take care of yourself and try to get enough sleep and all those things, but sometimes you just have to push yourself. Um, yeah. that's just kind of what it boils down to. And there's, there's a quote that's like all things in moderation, including moderation. And I think that that applies so often to what you're talking about. It's like, sometimes you, you can't just try to get nine hours of sleep every night, 
Like sometimes you have to go a week where you, you don't sleep that much and you get all these things done and then you recover and then you move on. And, but when it's yeah. something that you're passionate about and it's feeding your soul, it kind of balances out, I feel like. Um, Agreed. It's, it's worth it in the end. Um, and you're living through difficult times, not bad times, but difficult times with sort of a goal in mind maybe in the future that when you get there, it gets a little bit less intense. Like, I mean, I, maybe, maybe not, but do you feel, I know you still work like crazy and you do program coordinating and you do sassy and you take care of yourself and you're always traveling, like all these things. But do you feel like now that you have sassy as your main focus, some of the craziness has subsided a little bit? Oh, by a lot, by a lot, exponentially. Yeah. It's just being able to focus on what one versus two. And even within that, like the, one of the things that, a uh, good friend of mine, Manny Maldonado, and I talk about like time is the great equalizer and time is the great constant. Like we all have the same 24 hours and you have, you have, and I have, and all of us. And there are, of course, and I don't, there, there are lots of things that are put on people's plates. Like I can't even imagine. And on humans plates that they're having to deal with it. You and I can't possibly fathom or in every life situation is different. It's one of those uh, as we approach any situation, we don't want to speak in hyperbole, but time is the great equalizer and what we're willing to do and what we're willing to sacrifice at with that time is huge. And I think that can set you up for success or vice versa. So yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree, but yeah, it's become a lot more manageable. Are there times where it's hard, hard? Yes. It, it becomes harder, but um, it's much more manageable, much more sustainable on all of those things now that there there is one focus. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not surprised to hear that. And it's funny that you say that that kind of quote about time. I've been talking to several like band programs and universities and, and about a couple of different things recently. And one of the things I like to talk about is very related to, to this topic. But I always talk, say that quote, it's like Beyonce has the same 24 hours in a day that you do. And I just, yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's so perfect and it's so true. And like, you can go down a rabbit hole. Well, she has assistance and this and that and sure, but she didn't used to, you know, and, and you know, yeah. and you can sub in any successful person's name into that. But I feel like that's just, that's always, that's the common denominator when you hear about these stories of people that maybe it's not like they were born into this wealthy family with everything given to them. Like the people that make something out of themselves beyond where they started it seems like they've found a way to make the most of every second of every day uh, in a really meaningful way. And I, I just time and time again, I hear that. Um, and it's, I, I think we all hear it. It is one thing to hear it and sort of believe it. And I think it's a completely different thing to actually buy in and, and do it. And I, I, it's very few yeah. people are willing, I think, to go that extra step and make it happen, not just for a day or a week or even a year, but like on a consistent basis for a long time. And that's when the magic starts to happen. And it takes a lot of trust to, to be willing to go there because we're such an instant gratification kind of society where if we're doing, it's like, <laughs> there's a scene in Family Guy, I think, where he's at the gym, he does one lap, he weighs himself, does one lap around the gym and then weighs himself again and he weighs the same. It's just kind of an idea applied to a lot of things, you know. Um, yeah. If it's not going to give us a result pretty quickly, we will gonna, we're going to lose faith in it. And that's just sort of the nature of the beast. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of went on a tangent there, but I, that's, the, that's what my, all of what you said really made me think of. And that trust idea I always come back to because it's like that idea of process over product. You have to trust that if you dig into the things that you should do every day, the product will be there. But for some reason, we feel like if we just dwell on what is the end going to be, what is the end going to be, somehow that's going to make it better when really it's probably going to make it worse. But it's this yep. weird, it's a weird human nature thing. I don't know. We could, I could talk about human nature for way too long. So we'll, we'll, well, well, I think also with what you're saying, like you just have to trust that it's going to be there and you have to trust in the people that you surround yourself with. And like your, I, just a quick story, like there, there were times where it was slim when we were doing the university camps. Um, there will be times where people just didn't enroll. They just didn't enroll. And some of the, and these were changes that I made, but at one point we had six camps around the state. Um, university-based camps, now we only have three. 
Um, and it was because I thought location was everything and location really wasn't everything. It was when the times of when the camps were because people will travel from the Valley up to Denton if that schedule works for their family schedule. So we were actually competing against ourselves. I, I figured that out, but there will be times where I took myself and four other people with me to a camp. And the, re the reason I'm saying this is the, the rest of the staff completely understood that they're like, no, we get it. We understand like, you can't you can't function the business if we all went down to do this camp and then we would all just but it was it was all about like the the people we're surrounding ourselves with and understanding that in the end no this is something that will work it may not be working right now or working the way that i think it should but we're going to keep grinding away we're going to keep grinding away keep grinding away until we figure out and tweak or change and on that for all of the business the the, the entrepreneurs out there and all of those that you can't be afraid to just try new things and that's one of the you the the scary part about that is you have to own whatever you do like that that was one of the biggest things like for me we had six camps and i went you know what i'm not doing six camps anymore we're doing three i'm gonna cut the camps in half and we'll see what happens Woo! and enrollment at all the camps in those three camps was greater than the enrollment at the six camps and it was just me trying to like figure out, okay. And then from, from a business standpoint, like we could talk, talk strictly business here, but from there for me, then my expenses and everything were much less. So I had a greater enrollment, less expenses. So then I was like, okay, cool. And there were lots of decisions along the way that I've made that ended up the end result was better. And then there were also a couple of that I made these changes like, ah, oh, crap. Okay. Well, backpedal we got to change i got to go back to what i was doing or a version of what i was doing because what i thought it was is not what we changed it to so just not having yet you, you kind of have to be fearless you have to take calculated risks because that's the only way that you're going to see whatever you do and it kind of goes back to what we talked about initially but seeing seeing it evolve and not being scared of whatever it's just it's the grind you just get after it and you go do your thing so sorry random rabbit trail oh, it's good man it's good and it's I mean, it kind of boils down to, it seems like flexibility and being willing to do whatever it takes to do the right thing and not just doing it the same way because that's how you had done it. Um, you know, and that's, that's true. I feel like that's true of any leader in any career, entrepreneur or otherwise. That's yeah. such an important skill. Um, and you that, know, that was one of the foundation. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please. I, I was going to, well, I was just going to say that was one of the foundational things of our curriculum this summer was the idea of patience, flexibility, and creativity. But I, I think that that could be like, I, we just, we dug in on that given the, the pandemic and everything that we're dealing with. But I think those three components, it's, it's foundational to success in any, you got to be patient. It's not going to happen overnight. You got to be flexible and like everyone's talking about, well, we zig and now we zag and all of that, but that's life. Like you just got to be flexible and then you got to be creative. Like you have to figure out new ways of doing things and you have to not be afraid to try different things. And that's one of the, one of the things Daniel Montoya Jr. challenges me with all the time. Like I have different people in my life that challenge me in different ways. And Daniel's one of the ones that will go have lunch pre-pandemic and he'll say have you ever thought about and then he'll just vomit I don't like a whole world of ideas and some of them I haven't thought about some of them I have and you just take it all in and you roll with it and I think that that's key being creative is key to success so those three things patience flexibility and creativity I think for any young businessman out there businesswoman out there that's trying to start something entrepreneur trying to start something it's something that you need to double down on yeah, and that that's so great what you're saying about Daniel. I, I talked to Greg White, one of my colleagues at, at Reagan. It's like it doesn't matter who the idea comes from. If it's a good idea, you should do it. <laughs> that's right. Now, I feel like it's it's amazing to me how difficult it is for some people to grasp that concept. Because especially if you're like truly, if you're the leader, chances are you're you're probably going to get some credit for like almost any idea, if it's a good one, that your organization or your business, or your company is doing. So I don't, what pride, I don't know why there's that pride there that hangs people up that ultimately no one's going to even know or care anyway. It's like, that's right. And so, and I've found that obviously as a band director and especially as a designer of, you know, marching band shows, 
Um, but I can only imagine how true that probably is as well for you as a business owner across the board. Um, and that kind of, I mean, shout out, shout out to just a, as an example, shout out to Steve Smith. Um, when we first started the company, he, he came in in the early, early days of the company and the, the, the curriculum was all done on word documents. And it's something that Ron had put together or I would put together something or, uh, Nick had put together his, his word documents of conducting curriculum and they look terrible. The <laughs> content I guess was good and we kind of sold it, but it looked terrible. And Steve has an artist's eye and like, he, he, I just remember like, it wasn't a text probably back then. It was an email or a phone and him, him saying, Hey, what do you think if I tried my hand at this? Let me just put one together for you and see what it looked like. And I mean, he sent it to me. It was a game changer, like color pictures is like, and I know that sounds crazy to us now, but like having color and graphics that worked and fonts that looked the right way. And all of these things, like he sent it to me, I was like, Oh my God, this is great. And it was all Steve, 100% Steve. None of it was me. We, we put the content together, but he put it all together in his own way. And he's been doing it ever since. So you're right. It's, it's part of, I think all the best out there are confident in themselves, all the best leaders. And there's some level of ego. But I think the greatest leaders are the ones that have that ego, but know that, cool, like, no, they're better, that, they're better at that than I am. So they need to do that. I don't need to do that. They need to do that because they're better than me. And because they're better than me, they're going to make my organization look good and make consequently, not just the organization look good, but the participants for me specifically, um, the participants, the students, these high school kids are going to get more out of it because that teacher is better at that thing than I am. Yeah. So they need to go do that. And not only is that just good business practice, in my opinion, it also gives a level of investment to the people that you work with into yes. you and into the organization because if you truly do trust them and you they know that and they feel that um and you li like you live that on a daily basis in your relationship with those people and and they know like i couldn't even begin to list the number of things that my coworkers are are better than me at and I ask them to do those things because I know they're going to do better than me. And usually half the time I do it before I even have to ask, you know. But I think having that level of uh, responsibility and buy-in into what's happening, then, like I said, it makes them more invested. And then everything about what you're doing in your organization is going to be better. And like with a band specifically, then the adults are invested, which then makes them work harder to make the students be invested. And that even trickles out to the parents I've seen that more than ever in the last few years. And then it really, it becomes a very special place. And it surprises yes. me what, how often I hear about, especially like in corporate America, like the toxic work environment. And you know, that's coming from the top down, you know, that's just an approach from somebody that can't let go or has that lets their ego get in the way of delegating or doesn't understand how to bring the best out of people or allow them to have their strengths shine through for the organization. Um, it's amazing to me that that's, that's a, such a problem. Like you look somewhere that's, I don't know, like McDonald's, I don't know if that's true or not, but like places that are that massive that you think are going to have just the most brilliant, amazing leaders in, in the existence still have these workplace problems that relate to leaders who can't let go. And um, it's just, it's pretty, it's pretty shocking to me kind of to see that. And I want to say, yeah, this whole, no, no, go, go ahead. ahead. I was going to say, Steve. I was just saying the, <laughs> that is all the whole hot, the whole hot button topic of culture and workplace culture and all of these things. And you're, you're right. It's just quit being mean to folks. You know what I'm saying? Like let people, let people do the things that they're good at and quit being mean. Like, yeah, there's sometimes you as a boss have to say, no, we're not doing that. But hopefully you've done everything in the past with all of the people that you're like, you're leading, uh, if you could call it that, you're leading Mason and Greg and Ray and all of your staff and all of your parents, but they've seen you in the past give up things to them. So when you have to ultimately make the call and say, no, we're not doing that, they go, okay, that's yeah. fine. They may not like the decision or whatever, but they're okay with the decision. And you're right. Like, it's a, I mean, my mother-in-law was in corporate America for her entire career, both, uh, I mean, at, I, at major tech companies and the issues that she would talk about with with these managers it, it just blew me away like the way that some people were treating other humans it's it's, it's just wild 
and they wonder like they're talking about bottom lines and why why Simon Sinek, uh, who is an idol of mine, has made an entire um, thing out of starting with why and treating people the right way and starting with a, this people first mindset and making sure the people are taken care of and all. Of, in my opinion, that's not rocket science. Like that's that's leading a band program the right way. That's being a good teacher. That's just being a good person. But for whatever reason, uh, you talk about like that level one and I don't know I don't want to steal your thunder but that level one humanity or whatever it's called that you call that like getting beyond that is like this is just be good to folks and and people will be good to you for the most part like not in hyperbole but for the most part you you treat people the right way and knock on wood they'll treat people they will treat you the right way yeah and and some people won't and then you just have to be okay with that um yeah that's fine it is what it is and you can't let you know there's I'm super into this whole stoicism thing right now and, and Marcus Aurelius and all this stuff and what he he talks about with this like revenge is an extreme word it's not what we're talking about but it reminded me it's like you know the, the best the best way to get revenge on someone is to not act like them <laughs> it's like yeah yeah it's like it's so simple and so true but it's hard to do and it does relate sort of that level one what you just brought up and to me that is like to me level one is what your initial reaction is or what your first layer of human nature tells you to do immediately without really thinking through it and a lot of people just give into that in every aspect of their day and they maybe are unhappy and they don't understand why and that's why you know and and i don't want to get too far into it but i totally agree with you on that and there was one other point i wanted to follow up that you were talking about with just like um you know colleagues and, and the idea of delegating and trusting other people one thing that I have I've really learned and come to accept and understand is sometimes you're going to ask them to do something and they might like make a little mistake, you know, or something might go a little weird and it's not exactly how you wanted it. But I, I in my mind, have just decided that's the cost of doing business. Like you could have done all of these things by yourself and stayed up all day and all night for a week. Or there might be, it might have gotten done a little differently than you were expecting, or maybe there was a mistake in it. But when you zoom out and you look at the big picture and see what got done and what was important and like the efficiency of it, that that cost of doing business usually is is totally okay. And most of the time, it's just different than you were expecting. It's not bad. And not to go again, different doesn't mean worse, but like that's that's kind of truly what it boils down to. Um, and so sure. yeah what you're saying with like businesses and organizations should be people first and what Simon Sinek talks about and all that it's it is truly mind-blowing that people haven't just figured that out like other people want to feel purpose in their life they want to feel good about what they're doing and they want to respect and enjoy the people that they're around and then add on top of that whatever your company is and you'll be fine but you have to have that base and there's not yeah. anything that that doesn't apply to I mean and that's why Simon Sinek is such a uh, successful person because his concepts are universally uh, accepted and ap applicable to everything. Um, so, and, and whenever you hear him speak, you go, well, yeah, that makes sense right. because it's not rocket science. He's not, he's not talking calculus here or, or any upper level engineering thing. He's just like, treat people the right way. Yeah. And then you get out of them what do you need to get out of them because they'll want to give you whatever they can. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so true. And it, like, you know, ultimately, as a head band director or as the owner of a company, you know, the, the buck kind of stops with you, right? Like, at the end of the day, we know that, or you should know that. Sometimes not everyone completely seems to understand it. But beyond that, relationships and the people we work with are so, so, so important to what we do and how, how to be successful as a leader. And so I was, I was kind of wondering from you, like I've, I've watched you build so many incredible relationships. Like, do you have any thoughts on how you approach that? Does it mostly, I'm sure it happens organically because you're just a good person and you're personable, but do you have any advice to people maybe that struggle with that or just the way you look at developing relationships and what it means to you? Well, I'll say this before I go into the developing of it, the, the, the first lesson that we teach at any leadership camp that I ask any of the staff to teach at any leadership camp that we do, be it drum major or site base or whatever, and I, I make all the students write this down. You can write this down if you're out there. And the, the quote is, 
I, I think it's mine, but I don't know who, where it came from, but it was, I must have a positive relationship with the people that I lead. I must have a positive relationship with the people that I lead. And how do we do that? And what does that look like? And that's the very first springboard conversation that we have at any camp. Like, what does that look like to have this positive relationship? And if you get nothing else out of anything that we talk about at our camps or that I do, it's that one thing. And the question that I ask them, and I ask this to myself, like, why should anyone listen to you? Why should they care what you have to say as their boss? as their teacher. And I have to think about that. And I, I struggle with this at times. Like, why should my kids listen to me? And I'm talking about my own personal kids, my freshman in high school, and my eighth grader. Why should they listen to me? Why should they care what I have to say? Like, sh could I be scary? And I, I, le I lead them as a father through fear. Yeah. And at sometimes, are they scared of my reaction? Probably. I, I, of course, I understand that. But I want them to respect me. And I want them to want to listen to me. That's the key to everything and the, to the way that you built the want for anyone, your kids, your, your employees, or your students, the way that you built that want is through relationships. And it's the positive relationships that build and then fixing negative relationships. And I'm not going to sit here on Facebook Live or on Zoom or wherever we are right now and talk about that, that I don't have negative relationships or haven't had negative relationships. I was, and, and still a part of my personality is fire and brimstone. And and although my head is shaved right now, it used to be fire engine red. It got bleached out to strawberry blonde through marching band, but my, it was fire engine red and my personality matched it. And that's what it was. And it, um, because of that, there were times that I severed relationships and made um, emotional decisions versus rational decisions and all of those things. We all have mistakes in our lives. And me being able to swallow my pride and being able to say I'm sorry and apologize for those mistakes and try to rebuild those relationships relationships has been key but I think the, the the foundational aspect of any of this is fostering relationships with the people that you meet and I think the the number one thing that you can do to do that is take a genuine interest in that person and what they want and make it put it make it about them and make the conversation about them and a lot of people they're not good in social interactions just because of who they are and this will shock maybe some people out there, but I'm the most extroverted introvert you'll ever meet. And it's because of the gig that I do and what I've trained myself to do and all of that. And a lot of it just comes from, I continually, like when I'm meeting people or talking or engaging, I just, I ask questions and ask more questions and ask more questions and take what their, whatever response I'm getting and ask another question based on that response and try to make it about the person that I'm engaging with or talking to um, just so that they feel more at ease in the conversation. And, and more comfortable to share whatever it is that we're talking about. It could be it could be nothing. It could be we're trying to solve the world's problems in politics, or it could be something as how to how to smoke a brisket the right way. I don't know, but it's just all about trying to take a genuine interest in that person. And I think when you do that, it's the foundation to establish that relationship. And th there are some things that we talk about with the kids and stuff uh, of learning people's names and remembering people's names or remembering little tidbits about people or little things that you've heard them say in the past and it's just all little tricks of the trade like I'm a terrible 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 names person I for whatever reason that's just me personally but I can remember the most ridiculous small little details or little things that I've heard about people so I try to 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 tag people's names with some ridiculous like detail or something that I remember about them and just all of these little things so that when I later come across them it's not a a point of manipulation or I'm not doing anything, but the fact that I could run across a student after one interaction and say, hey, Katie, or hey, whoever, and I can remember their name, that means something. And that person walks away going, because I've had this experience, and I'll tell you a short story in a second, but I, I've had this experience where um, when someone said my name, I'm like, oh my God, they know who I am. Mm -hmm. Like they remember my name. Yeah, And one of the biggest, the biggest stories I have of that, the uh, rest in peace, Mr. Bruce Dinkins, the former director of bands at Bowie High School, who passed way too soon. We were at Midwest and we were at the Hilton Bar and we were, I was walking through and just coming down from my room and I was going to meet someone else. And Mr. Dinkins, who I thought the world of, like I respected him from afar, mentor that he didn't know I, he was being a mentor for me. And I remember him saying, 
from across the bar. Hey, Jeremy. Surely he's not talking to me. <laughs> and I was probably 20, 23, 24 year old kid just starting at Cedar Park. And he was building Bowie to be the Bowie powerhouse and all of these things. And I looked over and he's like, come here. And I don't remember who he was sitting at, but it was like he was holding court with all of these ABA band directors at down at the bar. He's like, I want to introduce you to this guy, Jeremy Spicer. And, da, 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 da. and he was like, he kept saying my name and he knew all these things about me. And we probably had one or two interactions and it made me feel like I was king of the world. And I was a, I was a 20 young twenties band director, but Bruce remember my name, Mr. Dinkins remember my name. And it was one of those things in my brain that it just stuck. Like if he can do that, and he teaches a 300 something piece band program and he has interactions with band directors all over the country and he remembered who I was, then that's something that I need to make a priority for myself and how I interact with students and then ultimately became a foundational principle for one of the things we talk about with Sassy. That's amazing, that's such a great story and it makes me think of the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I must mm -hmm. probably read it, but. For me, that was that was maybe the most like influential book on leadership and relationships that I've ever read. It just super resonated with me, and I liked it because it not only has concepts, it also gives you like specific ways of getting better at the skill of developing relationships. Which, you know, there is so many times where we're pontificating about ideas, but you're not given specifics. And anyway, it's a great book. Um, and, and going back to your point about being the most extroverted introvert, I don't think that's super uncommon. Um, and I kind of feel the same way about myself. I mean, I think people would be surprised to know, I'm sure students would be surprised to know and, and other adults or colleagues, like before rehearsal starts almost every time with students that I know super well and see every day, I still feel a little uncomfortable bef right before rehearsal starts, mm -hmm. you know, and before like when I'm walking, if it's marching man and I'm walking out to the parking lot, I sometimes have to really push myself to like say hi and be personable and all these things that people just, I'm sure assume come really naturally to me, but they don't always. And it's something that it seems maybe natural because I look at it almost like a skill, kind of like what you're talking about and something that I have to remind myself of constantly because of how great that is for, developing relationships and making people feel special and making them feel like they do have purpose and that they do matter and how important those things are for them and for the organization to really succeed. But I think it's important for people out there to understand that like these skills aren't just like natural things that come to a lot, if not most people. It's something that you have to consciously work at and develop. And I think we miss that miss out on that because you think about the one kid in high school who was so outgoing naturally and you're just like well he was just naturally like that people are just naturally like that you know and some people are naturally so i mean ellie is kind of naturally like that my wife is yeah but i, I think that she is the the, the exception and not the rule you know in my in my experience with people and so i think it's it's really important for people like you who is known as somebody who has all these relationships and knows everybody's name and is really thoughtful about all of that. It's something that you work at. And I think that's powerful yes. for other people to understand too. So thank you for sharing that because it's huge. It's massive. It's a, it's, it's a really big idea, I think. Um, and one of the things we talk about um, is what you're saying in, in anything, leadership is a skill quote leadership, this broad bubble, this over the top thing that everyone talks about, it's a skill. And because it's a skill, just like we teach trumpet and flute and clarinet, it has, to, your skill has to be practiced. Mm -hmm. It's not just gonna, you're not just gonna sit back and like, well, I read a book, now I'm a leader, or I went to a leadership thing and now I'm a leader, or to think about like what you're talking about, well, working out and doing all that. I went to the gym and I ran around and I weighed myself. Now I'm in shape. Like it doesn't work that way. It's a skill that has to be practiced and developed into something. And I think that's the challenge in any of it. Yeah. And again, it's, it all applies to, to all of it. Right. And you just kind yes. of point it's like, and it, it all it comes back to routines. It comes back to your consistency. It comes back to being happy, not satisfied essentially. Right. Because like, yes. you don't want to be miserable along the way. And that's why, that's why I'm so passionate about this specific idea is like, 
you want to get better and you want to dedicate yourself to all these things, but we're only here for so long. Like we don't want to be miserable during all of this progress. Like there's got to no. be a way to find joy in progressing. And I think that if you can find that sweet spot, you're really onto something. Um, and it's, that's what I'm kind of working at every day. And some days, some days it doesn't work, you know, and some days it works great. And I'm just trying to make the days that it works get more and more in number compared to the days that it doesn't. That's all you, all you can really ask for, I think. But mm -hmm. um, one last quick thing I want to talk about is just on top of how busy you, you are and all these things that we've already talked about, you have found a way to make your own personal wellness a priority. Um, yes. And even in the time that I've known you, I think you've developed it a lot and gotten even more passionate about it. And so first of all, like, what does that look like in terms of the time that you commit to it? How do you commit the time to it? And what, what do you do? Like, what does that look like for you? Well, for me, um, the, the wellness aspect of it, it, it was just, I want to, I want to live a long time. I, there's no other way to put it to, to like make it glossy or pretty or anything other than that. I, I just want to live a long time and I want to see my kids grow up and I want to see grandkids and I want to like all of the stuff, all the romantic, I want all of those. And I want my wife and I to grow old together. And I want to be able to be in my sixties and seventies and be mobile and in my eighties and be mobile and do things and all of that. So that's at the forefront of my brain and all of this and everything and all of the choices that I make with that. Um, so what do I do? I, I, I work out probably five or six days a week and I make time to do that. And it's variations on a theme of all sorts of stuff of what that looks like. I mean, it's been rowing and then my, uh, my wife, Elizabeth hurt her back. So, or uh, at that prior to that, there was something with her feet. So we did some low impact things. She bought a rower and then I fell in love with this rower. So it's been rowing and running. And then I've got into body weight training and then weight training and you name it because I'm so like, Oh, let's do this for a while. Then let's do this for a while. Let's do this just cause I get bored, but it's, just the act of physically doing something I think has been important for me. Um, and as I've gotten older, I'm 41 now and it's not old, but getting older, I just want to make sure that as, as we all get older, like muscle mass goes down. So like doing some weight training and some things so that I'm not losing muscle mass as I'm getting into my forties and moving toward and all of those things. Like it's, it's just been a priority for me. And on the flip side of that, like I think balance and everything in moderation is key. I love Mexican food and I have a huge sweet tooth and all of these things. And I'm not one of the things that I've learned from my wife. Like I'm not going to give up the, that. I'm just not, I, I like it, everything about it. I, I, if I could eat that way every day and still be in shape, I would, I can't. So I don't, but if I could, I would, because I love it. I grew up in South Texas and that's just what I love. And I, my sweet tooth is huge, but I've developed these tricks over the years that are, they're mental tricks. Like my, my wife and my kids make fun of me because I have my ice cream bowl and I typically eat and I want to exaggerate. I typically eat a, a bowl of ice cream every single night, but it's literally like this big. Yeah. Like it's, it's like a scoop. And then I put a couple of chocolate chips on it and that's my thing. Could I eat like a whole bowl of ice cream? Absolutely. But I trick myself and I've been doing this for years. Like Mike uh, Howard at Vandegrift, whenever we'd go out to eat or whatever, he would never get like dessert or a treat or like a milkshake if we went to a burger joint or whatever, because he always knew that I was going to get one and that I would take lit. And I'm not exaggerating. You can ask him. I would take like two or three sips. I was like, hey, you want the rest? Because I got exactly what I wanted. I got my little taste. I got my little sweet tooth. And then I passed it on and someone else finished it. So I just think for all of us, just any, everything in moderation and being able to just like anything, having the self-discipline to go, nope, I'm good or I'm not going to do that, or I'm not going to do this. And then with my recipes, like I, I cook a lot that want to, anyone that knows me knows that I love, I love entertaining for others. But, and I grew up in South Texas with all of these yummy, delicious meals that I would eat all the time, but trying to figure out ways to take that and make it healthy has been a priority for me. So like I, not, anyone that's had my Mexican food knows that uh, I would say that they think it's really pretty good, but it's not the way that it was made when I was younger. Like I, I've tweaked the recipes over time and I make them better and seasonings and all of that stuff. And I, I'm, I'm a constant foodie and I'm constantly watching things. So my whole approach to wellness has been um, 
exercising for sure, trying to balance what I put into my body in as much as possible. And then the last one for me in the idea of wellness, and I know you, you talk about it a lot on your channel and you're into Marcus Aurelius right now, but reading. Reading is a big part of my wellness. I haven't gotten really into the meditation thing. I've, I've, I've looked into that. It just hasn't been a thing for me yet, but it's something I've thought about. But the reading aspect for me, and it's not just reading for like improvement. I, I will, I, one of my favorite authors is John Grisham and it's just kind of the, the trash legal novels. I just think they're fun and I like them. I like all the stories and I love how he writes. I just bought one. Every book that he's come out with, I've read cover to cover. I bought one two days, two or th well, no, it wasn't that I'm exaggerating. It was last week and I read it in two days. Like I, I love that stuff, but reading and all different kinds of reading is, is huge. And I think that's been a part of if this is right for me, then I'm able to get out and go run, or I'm able to make myself go upstairs and work out or whatever it is. I just think it's forcing yourself to have the discipline. Like, and like Beth and I will joke that Beth, my wife, like, I don't want to work out. I don't want to da da da. I don't want to da, whatever. And sometimes she, like, she gets up in the morning because she has a hurt back and she gets up at six in the morning. And now she's found that biking is good for her lower back so she gets up and she goes so if she's going to get up at six then okay well I can go upstairs and I can work out it's just we we hold each other accountable and I think that's part of it too but for all of us I think the wellness boils down to you have to find what works for you and what what you're willing to do and just balance it all like no one's saying give up like I think uh, on on Ellie's channel it said on Sundays we eat bacon hell yeah you do like get it like that's what you, whatever, whatever your day is, like there are things that you're not going to give up and things that you're not going to give away. And that's okay. Yeah. That's 100% okay. I think, I think it's the moderation of it all. That's yeah. the key to wellness, whatever that is. Yeah, no, and it's the moderation and, and, and how that would lead to sustainability, I think. And to me, sustainability mm -hmm. is the number one problem with all of this for everybody because anyone... Yes can do something for a little while. Um, and you know, I use the example of the whole 30, that diet, it's like, I, well, I have watched so many people like suffer through this 30 days of eating in a way that they don't enjoy. And then to get to the end and then they just go back. And it's like, well, that doesn't, what did that just accomplish? <laughs> like, and so yeah, my, the moderation makes it sustainable, I think. And for me, um, you know, I'm a very, health conscious person. I'm super into wellness and self-improvement, all those things, but I don't really feel like I'm depriving myself of it in a food way ever, almost ever. Cause I've just, like you have, I've worked on it and I've thought about it and I've figured out ways to, to make it work for me where I eat ice cream too. I eat cookies, you know, I eat all kinds of stuff, but I don't eat the whole bag of Oreos, you know? And so it, it's, you have to, there's, there's a lot of things we could get into and I've got, I got to wrap up here, I think, but, um, the moderation and the sustainability, you, if having a cheat meal once a week is going to make it so that you eat the right way for the rest of your life, instead of for four weeks, then you should have a cheat meal once a week. You know, if That's right. eating a bowl of ice cream every few days is, is going to make it so you eat, get your greens in the rest of the day and, and you motivate yourself to exercise, then you should do that. But if you're, if you're looking for a get fit quick scheme, you might see some results for a little while, but chances are you're going to probably give up on it because it's not sustainable. And it's asking things of you that you're not either willing or able to do. Uh, and so you, you have to weave it into your life. You have to find ways to make it work for yourself. Uh, and you have to, above all else, you have to make it sustainable. Doing something is better than doing nothing. And as someone with an all or nothing personality, I have learned that over many, many years because I used to be all in on fitness and then do nothing for literally two years. And I'm not exaggerating. And I finally have found that balance and that sustainability. And, and I think it seems like you, you definitely have too. So I just want to touch for on that sure. for a second because I know that it's something that you are continuously getting like really great at. And you've, since I've known you, I think you've made it a priority. And as somebody who is a successful business owner and has done band directing at the highest level and all these really stressful, busy jobs, I think it's important for people to know that the most important job is taking care of yourself. Because like you said, you want to be around for a long time and you want to be around in a meaningful way.
for a long time. And so do I. <laughs> and I think. Yeah, for sure. People do. Yeah. So um, anyway, I, I really, I really do appreciate you being here. Where can, where can we find you or, or Sassy or all the things on the internet? You can check us out um, at our website, studentsleading.org, students, plural, leading.org. Um, you can check us out on at Sassy Leadership, on the old Instagram, on the gram, uh, admittedly not way out of my comfort zone, but I'm trying to be better at that. And I, when I say I'm trying to be better, I hire people to help me be better at that. So Cat Willer at this point is helping us do that. And eventually we will be doing some other things on the, on the gram. And, and so, so you can find us there at Sassy Leadership. Check us out. You can email me if, you, if you're interested in anything. We're doing some corporate things now, which I'm very excited about. Knock on wood, all of that takes off the way that it's at least planned to take off. But uh, email me at jeremy at studentsleading.org. And we'd love to help you, your company, your organization in any way possible, uh, be it through uh, mass speaking or keynote addresses or any of those things or training for your individual employees, we, we would love to help in any way possible. But Sassy Leadership, that's us, Jeremy Spicer and all of the crew. Perfect. Yeah. And if you're interested in Happy Not Satisfied, um, check out happynotsatisfied.com. Uh, I'm Daniel D. Morrison on Instagram. A lot of the stuff we've talked about and Jeremy's referenced it. I have a guidebook out. It's like a, a one-stop shop for wellness. It has tons of stuff in there about routines and, and goal setting and fitness and nutrition and everything in between. So um, that's up on the website uh, for you to check out. The shirt it's coming very soon. I know I'm getting requests for the shirt. It's coming soon, I promise. Um, but uh, look it up. It's coming. It's coming. Yours is coming in the mail. I can. I. I got a special one for you. It's on its way. So don't worry. Um, so yeah, happynotsatisfied.com. Daniel D. Morrison. Happy Not Satisfied on Facebook. But Jeremy, it's been it's been a true pleasure. This has been a, it exceeded my high expectations for this conversation. Um, thank you for everything that you've done for me personally for student leaders across the state, for our colleagues across the state and the country. Um, you are somebody that a lot of people look up to for a lot of really good reasons. So um, again, thanks for talking with me. Um, I'm sure we'll chat soon. And I wish you all the best with, with everything that you're working on right now. Thanks, brother. Stay safe, have fun with those kids in March, man. All right, sounds ah. good, take care. <laughs>